الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. This is an overview of the second موقف from the مواقف of عدد الدين الإيجي. This is the table of contents at the end of the book. I'm going to walk you through the topics that are covered in this second موقف. The second موقف is called الأمور العامة. Al-umur al-amma. Al-umur al-amma means the general matters. General matters. So he says, Al-mawqif al-thani fi al-umur al-amma wa fihi muqaddima wa marasid. It has an introduction and a number of different sections. Let's go to the section Al-umur al-amma in the mawaqif and see what this section is about. He says, الموقف الثاني في الأمور العامة General matters He says, أي So he's explaining the term general matters الأمور العامة He says, أي ما لا يختص بقسم من أقسام الموجود So there are أقسام الموجود Things that exist are divided into categories There's two main categories The category of the necessary existent and the contingent existent. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, God exists necessarily. Everything else can exists contingently. And contingent things that exist, according to the um, natural philosophy of the mutakallimun, are either a'rad, which means accidents or properties, or jawahir, which are um, objects or um, bodies. So he says, so the umur amma are matters, concepts that apply to both. لا يختص بقسم من أقسام الموجود. They apply to uh, the necessarily existent being, God. They apply to contingent things and they apply to both kinds of contingent things. Um, Objects, physical objects, and their properties. These concepts that are common, what are these common concepts? These are the concepts that they're going to explore in this section. And the reason why these concepts are important is because the higher level goal of the mutakallimun is to make a cosmological argument, to argue for the existence of God based on the existence of the contingent universe, the physical universe. And in order for them to do that, uh, there, there needs to be some kind of a commonality, some, some common ground, not commonality, but some common ground. And that common ground that allows us to speak of this and this argument and, uh, and reason in this way and reason to the existence of God these common concepts are al-umur al-amma. So he says, uh, we're going to look at what these umur amma are. Let's go on. Uh, he says over here, uh, al-eg, he says, وَفِيهِ مُقَدِّمَ وَمَرَاصِدِ This, uh, this موقف الثاني في الأمور العامة, it comprises an introduction and marasid uh, Sections. So, what's the introduction about? Let's look at the introduction. He said, Al Muqaddima fi Qismatil Malumat. He says, The Muqaddima, the introduction, is in dividing Malumat, things that are known. So, there's things that we know. Things that we know. We know about the existence of the universe. We know about the existence of the various things in the universe, the sun, the moon, the planets, the oceans, the clouds, the mountains, the wind, the sea. We know, we know these things. We know, about, we, we know about them. And we want to reason from them to the existence of someone on whom they depend. So that's where we're going. We're setting up the scene. Uh, so he says that the, that, the, that the things that we know are either, either they exist or they don't exist. They're either ma'doom, which means they're non-existence, or they are mawjood, which means they are existent. And according to the mutakallimun, this is the first position, 
uh, they say that uh, that uh, there's there's either a ma'dum um, or there is something they call sabbat. Sabbat means it exists, and there's no intermediary thing between them. There's nothing between existence and non-existence. He's going to discuss in this section a position of the Mu'tazila. They held that there's some kind of intermediary existence. There are some, they called it a hal. It doesn't have a full existent, existence, nor is, it an, nor is it non-existent. This is a discussion that's here for historical purposes. What we want to do is, after looking at the division of things into ma'adum and mawjud, note, uh, ma'adum and mawjud, non-existent and existent, mawjud is something, wujud, existence, is something common to contingent things and the necessary being. It's one of the umur amma. It's one of the umur amma. So wujud is something that's discussed in the umur amma. Adam, non-existence, is also discussed in the umur amma. But Adam is not common to the necessary existent and the contingent things because the necessary being cannot not exist. Non-existence does not apply to it. But it's mentioned by way secondarily. It's mentioned, they say, bittaba'iyya, because it's the counterpart of existence. So it's, it's, it, the, the two of them go together. So it's mentioned along with that. And it's mentioned as part of the Umur Amma. So the first section we're going to see in the Umur Amma is on Wujud and Adam. He's going to talk about existence and non-existence and about some of the topics that I've just introduced you to. If we go down, he's, he's setting things up. He, he talks about the hukama and he talks about the mutakaddimun. The hukama are the falasifa. These are uh, the falasifa. Um, they could be Avicenan falasifa or they could be falasifa who became, uh, who became part of the kalam tradition. They became Isla they became more Islamized, if you could say that. Um, but there's two knowledge traditions, and these two knowledge traditions they engaged the physical universe in two different ways. So the Hukama, the Mutakallimun, they looked at the universe and they divided it into uh, they uh, into al wajib li dhatihi and al-mumkin li dhatihi. Al-wajib li dhatihi means that which is, li dhatihi means intrinsically, it's intrinsically necessary. Mumkin li dhatihi means it's intrinsically contingent. It's, and we're going to look at these two things in greater detail. Um, the reason why he says li dhatihi is because something could be wajib li ghayrihi. Something could be extrinsically necessary. Means it's intrinsically Contingent, it could be the case, could not be the case, but because of an external factor, it must be the case. So anything that God has decreed will be the case, must be the case. But it's must being the case is extrinsic to it. It's not essential to it. It's essentially contingent. So he, the mutakallimu, the hukama, they divide things into wajib and mumkin. And so they uh, argue for the existence of God based on the argument from contingency. Historically, uh, with the uh, with the uh, hukama, with the philosopher, uh, the Avicennans, they in the tradition of Aristotle, they argued that the universe is contingent, the necessary being is uh, necessary, and the universe did not begin to exist. The universe has existed since eternity. It's an effect of the necessary being, and this effect has been taking place for an infinite quantity of time, if that's something that, that's coherent, actually not a coherent concept. They discuss this in the books of Kalam, but this is the history of the argument. And these philosophers were the main interlocutors of the mutakallimun. So 
since the mutakallimun are speaking to them, the main argument that the mutakallimun have made in their books, if you go and you read Sharh al-Aqa'id al-Nasafiya, or you read Jawharat al-Tawheed, or you read the Sanusiya, or you read the works of Imam al-Ghazali, all of the great mutakallimun, the argument that they made was not the argument from contingency. But it was the argument from the fact that the universe began to exist. Now this is known as the Kalam cosmological argument. So they divided things that exist into either being Hadith. Hadith means something that begins to exist or being Qadim. Qadim is something that does not have a beginning to its existence. So uh, they uh, and the and the they did this on a number of grounds. One of the reasons why they did this, one of the motivating factors, uh, was a practical uh, factor. And that's that if they prove the existence of God using the fact that the universe began to exist, then they rebut the position of the philosopher Avicenna's that the universe did not begin to exist. And they establish the existence of a necessary being who has the attributes of knowledge, power, and will, and isn't just an impersonal cause, as Avicenna and Aristotle believed. So uh, this is a motivating factor. There were often philosophical reasons as well. I'll introduce some of them. But because of this, because of this background, one of the things that we talk about in Umur Amma is al-wujub and imkan, necessity and contingency. These are things that are uh, included in the umur amma, even though they're not they're not really common. They're not really common to all things that exist. But when you have something that exists, you ask the question about it. it does it exist necessarily or contingently? So in that sense in the sense that this question is asked of both, these are considered to be part of the Umur Amma. And same with Qtidam, uh, beginninglessness, and Hudus, having a beginning. So we have a section in the Umur Amma which discusses existence and non-existence, another section that discusses necessity and contingency, another section that discusses Hudus beginning to exist and Qidam uh, not uh, beginning to exist. And uh, another, and there's two other sections. One is uh, on causality, uh, on cause and effect, uh, because we're going to argue that the universe is an effect that needs a cause. Uh, and uh, the other one is on uh, oneness and multiplicity. And I'll introduce to you some of the reasons why we need to look at oneness and multiplicity. Let's go back to the table of contents at the end. Uh, uh, just so oneness and multiplicity. Oneness is something that's common because God, uh, wahda, oneness applies to God and also to created things. Multiplicity only applies to created things. And illa uh, and ma'lul, this also, there's aspects of it uh, that are you know, God is the only true illa, uh, only true cause, think something that brings something into existence. Uh, but there's this is a question that's asked about uh, both kinds of things. And so it's included in the Umur Amma. So the Umur Amma, they're supposed to be common concepts, concepts that are common to both contingent things and the necessary being or created things and the beginningless being. Some of them are, some of them are kind of, um, some of them are secondary, but that's the general motivating factor that we are going to use these concepts to look at the universe and argue from the universe to the existence of God. And there needs to be some kind of language, some kind of concepts that are common. There's some kind of a common ground that will allow us to make this argument. Let's go back to the table of contents. So let's look at what the Umur Amma are. The first one, al marsadul Awwal, the first section in the Umur Amma is Al-Wujudu Wal-Adam, existence 
and non-existence. There's a number of discussions here. The first thing is he talks about the definition of existence. And some of the scholars, they said that it's uh, undefinable. It's undefinable because its meaning is understood without definition. So definitions are when you take, you constru constructing a definition means you take two concepts and you compose them in a particular way. They have to be special kinds of concepts in order for you to be able to construct a definition. But you compose two concepts. So there's two things that you know and you compose them together to form a definition. You say, for example, human is rational animal. So you take the concept of rationality and the concept of animalness. You compose them. You make a definition. So the uh, the the it's something that's definable because uh, it's uh, it's not primary. It's not basic. But th so there are certain concepts that are basic and they're undefinable and they're known non-inferentially without inference. Rational animal is known inferentially. Inference, you take two concepts, you compose them. That's a definitional inference. Um, others, there's others that are basic, they're undefinable, non-inferential. And so that's, uh, many scholars, they held that this is, uh, that it's, uh, it's undefinable because it falls in that category. There's a debate and he unpacks this debate in this first section. Then he says, في أنه مشترك الثاني في أنه مشترك مشترك this is an important um, discussion so according to the متكلمون the concept of existence is مشترك مشترك means that it is um, it's a uh, it applies it's a uh, it, it has the same meaning it has the same meaning when it applies to contingent things that it does when it applies to the necessary being. So when we say contingent things exist, and when we say that the necessary being, God, exists, the meaning of existence is the same. And they uh, they explain this and and this is it's uh, the argument is actually pretty straightforward the meaning of existence is the same where's the difference the difference is in two things the first difference is in the mahiya which is this is the second second uh, discussion of the umur amma which i didn't mention in the pre just previously Mahia. Mahia, this is a compound word. Ma means what? Hia, it's it, she. Mahia, the what it is. Essence, in other words. The essence of something is what it is. So uh, we say, the mutakallimun, they say that the, uh, that the mahia, the essence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his, uh, his, uh, his essence, he is essentially, he exists, he is, he is the necessary existent. He is al-wajib li dhatihi. He's the one who exists necessarily. This isn't actually his essence, um, according to the mutakallimun. According to the mutakallimun, his essence is unknowable. But there's, an, there's something that we can know about his essence. And that is that it entails that that he 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 is wajibly that he he is he is intrinsically necessary he is somebody who is intrinsically necessary so the he is the intrinsically necessary being and the intrinsically necessary being exists and contingent things exist where's the difference the difference is that contingent things, they exist contingently, and they necessarily, uh, contingent things, it's not, the, the difference is that contingent things, they are essentially contingent. Whereas the necessary being is someone who is intrinsically necessary. So there, there are 
their mahiyat are different. Their es- they're essentially different. There's, their essences are different. They're different things. And that is what exists. The thing that exists the th- is God, the necessarily existent and the contingent things. When we say that they exist, this concept of existence is a mental concept that we have in our minds and we use it to make sense of the world as human beings. And when we apply the concept of existence to both according to the mutakallimun, it's the same. That's what it means when he says the wujud is mushtarak. That's one difference between the two. The other difference between the two is the modality of the statement. The modality of the statement that contingent things exist and the necessary being exists. Modality is a... According to the Mutakallimun, it is a... Uh, I'm, going, I, I'm going to unpack this in a second. I'm going to unpack the modality uh, when we get to the next uh, next uh, section of the Umur Amma. Uh, but hold that thought for a second. What I've just introduced you to is this idea that according to the Mutakallimun, the wujud is mushtarak, it's common. The philosopher, they also hold that it's mushtarak, but in a different way. Um, they say they do say that what it means for God to exist is different from what it means for contingent things to exist, and that's a discussion that is that comes out here. And Imam Abu Hassan Al Ashari has a completely different position, and that wasn't accepted by the later Ashari's nor by the Maturidis, but it's mentioned here for historical purposes. And he talks about, uh, he talks about, um, he says that أَنَّهُ زَائِدٌ عَلَى الْمَاهِيَةِ This is another thing, another um, important point. He says that uh, that existence is زَائِدٌ عَلَى الْمَاهِيَةِ Mahiya is what a thing is, its essence. And he's saying that existence is not part of the essence of a thing. He's saying that there is a thing, there's something that it is, and then you think about it. Is, does something like this actually exist or does it not exist? It's described by existence. De- depending on an inference process. And according to the Mutakallimun, there are, it's different. According to the Hukama, according to the philosopher, they're one thing. Uh, they would say that, that his uh, existence is his essence. This is a discussion that's mentioned, um, but the dominant position of the mutakallimun is that uh, is that Allah subhanahu wa taala his essence that wujud is zaid al mahiyya in both contingent things and the, and things that exist necessarily according to the uh, philosopher it's zaid al mahiyya it's in addition to the mahiyya uh, with respect to contingent things but not with respect to the necessary being. Uh, then he talks about the Mahiya, uh, he talks about Platonism and the ideal, uh, his ideal forms uh, and uh, uh, rebuts that. Uh, he talks about some other things to do with essence um, and uh, then he, uh, he talks, he goes to the third discussion in the Umur Amma, which is Al-Wujub Wal-Imkan Wal-Imtina. Wujub means necessity. Imkan means contingency and imtina means impossibility. So this is an important section and we're going to do a little bit of a deep dive into this section. Al-Marsad al-Thalith, the third of the uh, sections in Umur Amma. And this is fil wujubi wal imkani wal imtina wa fihi maqasid. And it has a number of subsections. The first section he says, tasawwuratuha daruriya. This means that their conceptions are non-inferential. Literally, this is what it means. What he's saying is that they're not definable. These are basic concepts that we all understand. We all understand what it means for something to be necessary, for something to be contingent, and for something to be impossible. Um, And he says that, uh, وَمَنْ رَامَ تَعْرِيفَهَا 
لم يزد على أن يقول الواجب ما يمتنع عدمه أو ما لا يمكن عدمه. He says that anybody who tries to define them, he as as he can only go as far as to say that the necessary something that's necessary is that whose non-existence is impossible. So necessity is defined in terms of impossibility. He says, أو ما لا يمكن عدمه Or he says that which is it's not possible for it to, uh, to, to, to not exist. So necessity is defined in terms of uh, contingency. And contingency will be, uh, will, you know, it'll, necessity will come into the definition somehow. Um, so uh, he says that, that each one of these three فَيَأْخُذُ كُلَّمْ من الثلاثة في تعريف الآخر. Each one of these three, they come into the definitions of the other. So he says that the strongest position is that they are known without inference. They're basic concepts that we all understand. And if somebody denies them, they're being obstinate and they're denying something that they do understand. This is part of our humanity. This is how we know God. It's a fundamental, it's, the, it's according to some of the mutakallimun, it's the most fundamental thing that a human being does. And the most important thing that a human being does is distinguish between contingent things, necessary things, and there's only one necessary being, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and things that are impossible. He says, so if they're undefinable, then can you give us, tell us something about them? He says, he's going to tell us some of the khawas. Khawas are um, th- exclusive properties. To help us conceive this idea, he's going to tell us some of the exclusive pl- properties of, some th- of necessity, something that exists necessarily. What are some exclusive properties that set it apart from everything else so we can alert ourselves, we can draw attention to the basic concept of necessity that we all understand as part of our humanity. Uh, this is our fitrah, our, 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 the thing upon which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created us. He says, وَهِيَ ثَلَاثٌ There's three, uh, There are three exclusive properties that apply exclusively to the one who exists necessarily, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What is the first? He says, فَالْأُولَى إِسْتِغْنَاؤُهُ عَنِ الْغَيْرِ The first is that al-wajib, the necessary being, doesn't need anything else. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't need anything else. This idea is there in so many verses of the Qur'an. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says in the Qur'an that Allah is غَنِيٌّ عَنِ الْعَالَمِينَ He is completely free of need of everything else that exists. When we say, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, all praise is deserved by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this idea is there. It, there's this idea of everything needing him and him needing nothing. And this is the greatest praise that we can give to him. And it's a beautiful, uh, it's a beautiful um concept realization of uh, uh, this necessary existence and we express this when we prostrate to God we are expressing our neediness and in the realization of our neediness our our neediness is realized in relation to the complete lack of need of the one we are worshiping there are two sides of the same coin. One is only realized in relation to the other. And this is part of the exclusive characteristics of the necessary being. This is one. The second is, he says, The second exclusive characteristic is that the uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his that, the necessary being, their, their their being, the being of the necessary being, entails his existence. 
whereas the being of contingent things doesn't entail its existence. That's why contingent things need something else to make them exist because existence is not essential to them. It's not something intrinsic that belongs to them. It's something that's given to them by someone else. But the necessary being, um, they, uh, the, is that being that entails um, that it exists. He says, Athalitha, Athalitha, it's that being that entails, meaning that who it is entails that it is. Athalitha, a shay alladhi yamtazu bihi dhatu anil ghayr. So he says that the third exclusive characteristic is that this is this the necessity of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's existence is the property by which he is distinguished from everything else. It's the property by which he is distinguished from everything else. The essential difference between the the most primary difference between us and the necessary being is that he exists necessarily. He's the necessary existent. And we are contingent things. And this sets us apart completely. Completely. Uh, so these are, he says that these are umur mutalazima, they go together, but they're just, uh, uh, they're, they're, they entail one another. But when we understand these things, then these are like hand-waving explanations of what al-wajib li-zatihi, the intrinsically necessary being, is. We have an understanding of this in our minds now. So this is the first discussion that he has about, uh, in this section, al-wujub wal-imkan wal-imtina. Very useful um, understanding, very useful explanation, something that we need in order to do kalam. Um, let's look at, he discusses a number of other things. Um, uh, we're going to skip them and go to a number of interesting uh, and useful distinctions. This is a very, very, very nice distinction. He says, وَعَلَمْ أَنَّ هَذِهِ غَيْرُ الْوُجُوبُ وَالْإِمْكَانُ وَالْإِمْتِنَاءُ أَلَّتِيهَا جِهَاتُ الْقَضَاءَ وَمَوَادُّهَا This is now talking about modal logic. Uh, modal logic is a very important subject. It's uh, discussed in the books of logic, Islamic logic. Um, and it has a, uh, a very important relation to the argument for the existence of God. So modality, it's like this. So when I say that uh, God exists, or I say... that the universe exists, or let's take something in the universe, let's take Zayd, let's say Zayd exists. Zayd exists. Let's say something else about Zayd. Let's say anything about Zayd. Or let's say like anything about, let's say the sky is blue. These are all statements. They're predications. You're saying X is Y. All of these are X is Y statements. So when you say X is Y, X is called the subject. Y is called the predicate. When you say X is Y, this is the predication. And you, can, you have the modality is a description of a predication. In other words, X can be Y necessarily, or X can be Y contingently. It's a property of a predication. Contingency and necessity are properties of predications. So when we say God exists, we are saying that God exists and this, the, the uh, predication of existence to God is a necessary predication. It cannot not be the case. It must be the case. But when we say Zayd exists, or the sky is blue, the modality of this predication is that it's a contingent predication. 
meaning that it could be the case, it could not be the case. So when we say God exists, it's actually a different kind of statement than Zayd exists. This goes back to the beginning of this section when we saw that the concept of existence is common. When we say God exists and Zayd exists, existence means the same thing. But God and Zayd are not the same thing. And the modality of this predication is not the same thing. That's the difference. That's the difference. And there's an... Uh, so... Uh, this is as a side thing. The reason why modal logic is so important is because um, when we say all scientific statements, anything, you, any statement that you make about the universe, they have a modality of contingency. They're contingently true. But statements about God are necessarily true. God and his properties, God is powerful. And uh, the science of Kalam proves that, demonstrates that. But th this distinction is it's part of our realization of this idea of necessity and contingency. But what he said, he's saying here, he's, he's saying something very important here. He's saying that, he says, So he says, he's talked about the necessary being, the necessary being, i.e. God. That necessity is different than the necessity of the predication. So when we say, when we say the necessary being exists, the necessary being exists, and we say that this, this, uh, this, uh, the modality of this predication is necessity, in other words, exists necessarily, the necessity, that's the modality of this predication, is different than the necessity that is describing the kind of being that the necessary being is. There are two different concepts. We need to distinguish between the two. Um, so this has implications on the on the on the fallacies that are inherent in the ontological argument. The scholars of Kalam would not accept it. They would say that it begs the question. The uh, well, there's one more. There's actually two more discussions that I think are important here, and this is just I'm illustrating the usefulness of this. Um, of uh, Umur Amma in general, um, and uh, so he's saying, uh, he, he let's go down to the third, the fourth uh, discussion in over here. He says, fi abhathil mumkin issues related to contingent things, mumkin nidatihi something that is intrinsically necess uh, contingent. He says, wahiya arbaatun. There's four discussions. I want to look at the first and the fourth. The first is, he says, qal al hukama al imkanu muhwijun ila sabab. Al-imkanu muhwijun ila sabab. So there's a question that the mutakallimun asked. They said that the universe depends on God. The universe needs to be made, is in need of God. The universe is in effect. The universe is in effect. The universe is dependent on God. They asked the question, what is it about the universe that places it in need of God? Is it the fact that it's contingent? Or is it the fact that it began to exist? So the, uh, with the hukama, with the philosophy, it's clear. Because they make the argument from contingency, so they're saying that the basis of the universe's dependence on God is its contingency. Right? And so he, he's, he's going to explain this, but we're gonna, what we're going to see is that, and, and what you would expect is that according to the Mutakallimun, because they prefer the argument from Huduth, that's the one that's primarily there, you would expect them to say that the basis of the universe's dependence on God is the fact that it began to exist. Um, and some of them said that, but the position of the muhakkikin, of the uh, the position of the late scholars of kalam who 
examined all of these issues with a critical eye and looked at it really deeply, like Al-Ij, is that even though the Mutakallimun, they made the argument from Huduth, really, the basis of the universe's existence upon God is its contingency. It's not the fact that it began to exist. This has implications. It, it, it implies that the argument uh, from uh, the beginning of the universe actually on a philosophical level returns to the argument from contingency. Um, but we'll explore that at a separate time in a separate discussion. But now I want you to just keep this in mind. And um, he says, قَالَ الْحُكَمَا الْإِمْكَانُ مُحْوِجٌ إِلَى السَّبَبِ So now uh, the fact that something is contingent uh, is, he says that it, it makes it that's why it needs a cause. Why is it that things need a cause? It's because they're contingent. Contingent things need a cause. If something is contingent, it needs to be made the way that it is by something else. He says that wafi isbatihi manhajan. He says so all contingent things need a cause. He says in order to prove that there's two approaches. The first approach is darwat darura, is is to claim that this is known non inferentially. And the other approach is to say istidlal, that you need to prove it. So the fact that contingent things need to be made the way that they are by something else, they need a cause, is it something that's known non-inferentially or through inference? There's two positions, he mentioned both. And uh, he goes back and forth and he mentions them, but at the end he says, فَالْأَمَمُ الْمَيْتَ هُوَ الْأَوَّلِ which is a complicated way of saying that the correct position is the first, meaning that the contingency of the universe is something that is, uh, that the fact that something is contingent needs a cause is something that's known non-inferentially. This is, these are all extremely useful concepts because what we've seen is that the fact that something is contingent Contingency, the meaning of contingency, we know without inference. Um, and uh, he didn't, we didn't go through it, but the fact that the, that the things in the universe are contingent is also known without inference. And the fact that contingent things need a cause is also known without inference. He's saying these are all non-inferential things. They're non-inferential things. Um, and so if somebody challenges this, they're challenging something that cannot be proven that they actually know to be true themselves, but they're just denying it. Um, so he says, فَالْأَمَمُ الْمَيْتَ هُوَ الْأَوَّلِ So this is the first uh, thing that I want to look here. He actually says here at the end, he talks about, he says, خَاتِمَ قَالَ الْمُتَكَلِّمُونَ The mutakallimun, um, they said, الْمُحْوِجْ هُوَ الْحُدُوثِ so, uh, some of them said that the, that the thing that makes the universe have a need is huduth, the fact that it began to exist. Waqil, some of them said al imkan ma al huduth, both uh, contingency and the fact that it began to exist. Waqil imkan bi shart al huduth, and it said that it's uh, contingency with the condition of uh, coming into existence. وَقِيلَ الْكُلُّ ضَعِيفٌ And it said that all these three are ضَعِيفٌ and that the correct position is the position of the uh, of the uh, uh, philosopher. And if you look, if you read the commentary of Jurjani on the Mawaqif, he this is the position that he's going to support. This is the correct position. Um, and the reason why the Mutakallimun, some of them, when they say that it's Huduth, that's the uh, that necessitates, uh, that's the cause um, of, that, that is the basis of the universe's dependence, is that until things come into existence, they don't actually have a need. Because you can conceive of, uh, of uh, contingent things not existing. These are just conceptions. They don't need something to make them not exist or exist. Only when they come into existence that they come to have a need. And that's true. That's a true statement. Um, but what's the basis? What's, the, what's more basic? The thing that's more basic is contingency. That's also a true statement. It's a complex and interesting discussion. Um, but one of the things that this reveals 
is that it's the argument from contingency that's primary, simpler, and stronger. And the argument from Hudus, uh, uh, although it's prevalent in the books of Kalam, it returns to the argument from contingency. And uh, and the reason, and you know, it seems that the reason why uh, the scholars of Kalam they used the argument from Hudud, which is a good argument, it's a strong argument, it needs to be made, um, and it is made now. It's called the Kalam cosmological argument. Uh, but the, the the reason why it became so popular is because it's a convenient way of dealing with their primary interlocutors. I mean, this is why when I uh, when I present the traditional Kalam argument, I prefer to present the argument from contingency over the argument from the uh, fact that the universe began to exist. Philosophically, it's sounder, it's easier to communicate. But the other one is also true, and the Big Bang has made it more prominent. And that's important. It's an important consideration for us to keep in mind. The last point over here that I wanted to say is look at he says وَرَابِعُهَا أَنَّ الْإِمْكَانَ لَازِمٌ لِلْمَاهِيَةِ He says um, that contingency is entailed by what things are. لَازِمٌ لِلْمَاهِيَةِ What this means is uh, is that when you understand what anything is in the universe you understand what water is you understand what the sun is, you understand what a horse or a dog or a human being is, your understanding of what it is entails that you understand that it's contingent. And this is, uh, I mentioned that this is why we know that uh, uh, that things are contingent. We know this without inference. So this is this is the way that we, um, that we know it. And the... Uh, the most the the you know, mahia this concept of mahia is used for many different purposes the philosopher they used it to construct a natural philosophy from the perspective of the mutakallimun the relevance of it these are the these are the kinds of discussions why why it's relevant because it allows you to clearly identify uh, how the universe depends on god and remember the purpose of the mutakallimun is to um, prove points of faith and uh, uh, the most important of which is the existence of God. So let's look at the table of contents for this uh, section again. Al-wujub wal-imkan wal-imtina. The first thing he talked about was, he said, tasawwuratuha daruriya, that they are uh, conceived of non-inferentially. Second thing he says, that umur i'tibariya, it means they don't have any extra mental existence. They're just... Um, things that are conceived by the mind, abstracted by the mind from uh, uh, from reality, um, or inference from reality, uh, in the case of uh, of the necessary being. And then he talks about al wajib li thatihi and al mumkin li thatihi, uh, the necessary being and contingent things. We just we looked at some investigations from there. Then he talks about the Qadim, beginningless and the hadith, the things that began to exist. This is related to the argument from contingency. This is related to the argument from the fact that the universe began to exist, the Kalam cosmological argument. Um, the next section is on oneness and multiplicity. So this has partly it has a historical reason. Uh, the uh, philosopher they used to say that from the one only one comes uh, you don't have you can't have multiple things coming from the one who's absolutely one and that's why they posited a series of emanations by which uh, the unity of god successively became uh, more multiple uh, resulting in the multiplicity that we see in creation baseless argument it doesn't have any foundation uh, but that's one historical reason why this is here another reason why it's here this, this is related to discussions of mahia as well it's also related to discussions of number and counting and that's uh, uh, that's important because um, if you want to prove the fact that the universe began to exist then you have to uh, prove that it's impossible for an infinite quantity of time to elapse. So infinity is not kasra. It's not a multiplicity. Um, and looking at that is related to this section. He talks about uh, uh, 
he talks about uh, the uh, numbers here, maratib uh, al-adad. There's other uh, discussions related to contingent things um, over here as well. Um, opposites, kinds of opposition. And this is related to contingency and uh, it's part of the argument for the uh, for the dependence of the universe upon God, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Variety is an is an is evidence for contingency even though contingency doesn't need to be proven variety it uh, if you have variety it entails contingency very easily and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the quran he um, argues frequently from the variety of things in the universe to um, the, to god uh, and that uh, there's a contingency aspect there there's also other kinds of arguments uh, we'll explore that in the section of the Mawaqif where he talks about arguments for the existence of God. It's also, of course, related to the oneness of God. So uh, these are all, um, these are all, uh, they come in, in the section on Umur Amma. And Wahda is Am. Oneness applies to both the necessary being and contingent things. However, Kathra does not apply to the necessary being. The necessary being can only be one. It's one in a way that does not allow for multiplicity. Whereas... Contingent things are one in a way that does allow for multiplicity, either hypothetical or actual. Um, and finally, the last section, this is also very important, is fil illa wal ma'lul. Illa is a cause, ma'lul is the effect. And over here he talks about, uh, for example, he talks about, uh, he talks about daur, circular uh, causation. Uh, he talks about the self-soul infinite regress um, and various uh, Questions regarding causation, such as this is a famous rule that the mutakallimun make: an effect can only have one cause. An effect cannot come about through a combination of two causes. It can only have one true cause. Um, this is related to arguments for uh, related to free will um, and other issues as well, uh, oneness of God as well. Um, and then there's a, a number of other discussions that are of philosophical interest. He, just, he defines what a cause is, what an effect is. And these are the sections of Umur Amma, and they're used in the rest of the book. So the rest of the book will refer to these things as we construct our argument for the existence of God um, and the truthfulness of his messengers from the universe.